does, and that is the ministry that we support from this church. So we're going to be looking forward to, to him being there uh, with that. So Wednesday night supper, uh, Sunday night preaching, uh, anything else I need to... Thank, yeah, that's right. That's right. Global hunger. You'll see um, should be in your pews. And what we're going to do is we, we told you last Sunday we we're going to take up a love offering. And this feeds people that are hungry all over the world and that would love to have a bag of popcorn if they could get it. So it's there. We're going to take up in a little bit. We'll take up our regular offering first. And then after we at the conclusion of that, then we're going to ask you to put a little extra in there. Put it, there's envelopes there if you want one, or you can just drop uh, the money into plate, whichever you want to do. And that will go uh, to help and feed people that do not have food to eat. So I encourage you to put something in there. Help us get that done, okay? All right. Let's begin our services this morning uh, with our children's ministry. So I'm going to ask our children now. Well, let's go. Look, no, we've got to sing first. I get all this stuff mixed up. Been a rough week for me this week, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm on the mend now. Uh, Mimi, come and lead us in our, our song. Let's stand to begin our worship this morning as, as we sing together now. <laughs> Children, y'all come on up. I got a, a good story. Y'all help me out here now. I got a good story to tell you this morning. If I can find it. There you go. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all. Thank you so much. Last week, I told you about a, a lady that didn't have any children and that she prayed to God that God would give her children and what she said to God was what? If you'll give me a child, I'll give that child back to you. I'll turn him over to you and you can do as you want to with him. So that is exactly what happened. She had a little boy. She kept him at her home for several years till he could grow up a little bit like some of y'all. And then one day she picked him up and they went off and they went to the temple and there was uh, the priest named Eli and she gave him her son whose name was Samuel. And so Samuel stayed with her and we talked about the fact that the mama would go see the little boy maybe once a year and visit. Well, he began to grow up in the church. And while he was in the, the church, as God begins to use him, he doesn't know, but he's sleeping in the bed. Let me ask you something. Any of y'all ever been sleeping in the bed and heard any voices? Hmm? Nobody? Y'all must be, you have? 
I think the rest of them sleeping on the wrong side of the bed. What you think? Yeah. Well, Eli's there, and he hears a voice, or Sandy. It scares him. He'd never heard anything like that in his sleep, so he jumps out of his bed, and, and Eli and the priest is in another room. He runs over to where Eli is, and he said, Did you hear that? He said, No. Go back to bed. So he goes back, and he gets in the bed, just about falls asleep, and guess what happened to him again? He hears somebody talking to him. Runs back over to Samuel's bed, or to Eli's bed, and he says, did you hear that voice? He said, no. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes back, gets in the bed the third time. Guess what happens the third time? He hears the voice. That's right. He hears a voice again. He runs back over to Eli the priest. And now Eli says to him, you need to go back to bed. And this is what he told him to do. He said, before you go to sleep tonight, you say this, Lord, if you speak to me, I'm going to listen. So he gets back into bed. He, said, he tells the, the Lord that he's going to do that. And guess who came and spoke to him that night? God did. In a voice. And he heard that voice. God talked with him. And you know what he talked to him, with him about? The things that were going to come his way. The things that he had done in the church as he had learned about God and what God was going to do. And he talked about the things that were going to happen. The most important thing that I told you is this, that when God spoke to him, he listened. People in the Bible at all, and I preach about it a lot, Wednesday night, Sunday nights, people, what happens to people that do not listen to God is not good. And so he, this little boy sets the example that. So you know what happens to him? He grows up, and guess what he becomes? The priest. He becomes the priest of the temple. Matter of fact, the Bible has two books that were written about this man. Samuel. And so he started out as just a young boy. But as he grew up, he listened to God. God used him in a way that he nor his mom nor anybody else ever dreamed that he would be used. And that's my prayer for you today. That when you get a little, that you grow like Samuel did. And one day, God will speak to you give you a message, and God will use you in his ministry some way. That would be one of the greatest things that would ever happen to you in life, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you're able to, to use the little children, God. That God, from the time they're a baby born until they become a young man like Samuel, and then later on in life, God, you made a priest out. I thank you for his mom that, that raised him and, and kept her promise to you that she would give him back to you. God, I thank you for children. We see them now, but nobody in here has any idea about what they're going to become one day. God, I pray they'll be like Samuel, and they'll listen to your voice, and God, you will lead them. For it's in Christ's name we pray.
Okay? Come on, baby. Y'all go with Tammy then. Y'all go with them. They'll take you back there to church. All right. Thank you so much for that. This time I'm going to, well, I want to, I want, uh, before I pray and we begin uh, and we come and take up our offerings, I got a, a card that uh, I want to read to you. To the church family here at Southside, it says, Dear Church Family, thank you so much for the beautiful peace of Lily and the fantastic feast prepared for our family. The food was delicious, and the love it was prepared and served with will always be remembered. All the prayers, love, concerning kindness are unforgettable. God has blessed us with such a loving church family. We love you all, the Brown and the Franklin families. So, church, thank y'all for doing this. And do not forget that tomorrow, uh, Mr. Jimmy Russell passed away Thursday evening. His funeral service will be here at the church tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock. Visitation will be from 2 to 3 with the family here at the church. At 3 o'clock, we'll, we'll have his funeral. So keep the family in prayers and get an opportunity to come and uh, let me encourage you to do that. Anything else we need to mention? All right, I'm going to pray our offertory prayer and then me and me will come and lead us in a song because this has to do with my message today. Praise him, praise him. Father, I thank you, God, that on Sundays, as the scripture says today, that you want us to worship you. That God, that's the day out of all days, one day, that you set aside for us to come to church, to worship you. And the Bible says, in, in spirit and in truth. So Lord, I just want to say, as I do, thank you so much for all these and, and in other churches that have set aside the day and, and they're in your house this morning, and those that have tonight will be back tonight. Uh, God, I pray you give great blessings to your church today, to your people, that, Lord, uh, they would feel the presence. Lord, I, I say this a lot, but I mean it. There's not anything going to happen in a church or anywhere else for God unless you show up. And so, God, I pray you'll show up, and I know you're going to show up. God, I do pray for those that are sick. I pray for Especially for Mr. Douglas, Lord, uh, uh, down in, in the hospital. I, I pray for uh, uh, Gary's son, Lord, in the hospital in uh, Columbia. Lord, I, I pray for Mr. Uh, Russell's family. And these, they've been strong. They're great. Lord, I thank you for that. They know about God and they know about faith. Lord, I pray that you would be with them tomorrow as we have that service. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you, God. Words cannot explain how blessed we are. But thank you, God, for your blessings. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, Mimi's going to come. Our ushers going to come. We take our regular offering up at this time.
our uh, global hunger often. And just remember this. It says that this world is facing the worst hunger crisis that it's seen in over 40 years. And it's going to get worse. I'm going to just go ahead and give you a prophecy. It's going to get much worse than what it is. You listen to me on Sunday night. You know that. The Southern Baptists, we believe that this number is unacceptable to strengthen. So, so together we're changing it. Last year, gifts to the Global Hunger Fund uh, uh, were 15 million hot meals, 11 million grocery packages, and 32,000 people trained in hunger alleviation. So don't talk a lot about it all year long. But we know all of our ministries affect people. This one gets down really where you had not got food and you can eat. So let me ask you, me, me, would you lead us in uh, another verse or so? And if the ushers are coming, they're going to take up your, your global hunger off and off and right now. Okay. Oh, just me, Jesus. Do what? That's right. That's the thing about every penny you put in here buys food. Amen. Every penny you put in here buys food. Thank you, Ms. Cody. All right. Hit. Special music this morning before I preach, and Wendy has is go sing for us. So Wendy, you come on and sing for us this morning.
spoken remains. Will the preacher whisper as she raised her hand? Sweet Holy Spirit, come by her and stand. And when her tears started flowing, he had no doubt that in the throne room of heaven, her secret was out. Spoken request. Does anybody have one here tonight? Did you come with a burden you can't share? A need in your life. Well, just lift up. think about that song, Wendy, I think about tonight or Wednesday night, we have a prayer list that has numerous names on it, and oftentimes I'll say, there are a lot of people that need prayer whose names are not on this list. They have those unspoken requests. So everybody, I, I do know this for a fact, everybody at some point in their time, need somebody to pray for. If you have lived very long in your life, there's probably been a time that maybe you didn't even know somebody was praying for you. I've got some songs. You know, I, I'm a big McKamey fan, and uh, one of their songs says, I'm praying for you. When I go to bed at night, I'm praying for you. It's a good one. So I, I like that. And uh, so, anyway, today is the uh, last Sunday of the month. And I, what I try to do most times when it's uh, feasible to do it, and I have done it for the most part, is to preach the next psalm and that we're in our preaching series that I started when I came here. Uh, we've moved up now to the 92nd psalm. So we know that, uh, that uh, whether you like it or you don't, I've been here 92 months. <laughs> and uh, so I know I got 92 down. And uh, I did the same thing years ago at Northside now. I'm about to peek out because I got to 93 there. So we're going to see if I can last another week. How about that? Okay? And then we'll tie the record. Another month. Not a week, but a month. All right. Psalms 92. I want to want you to read it because it's about worship. It's about praise. It's about why we worship, why we should praise uh, God with all of our heart. He tells us that in this. Let's read it. And I, this, hopefully I'll move through it fairly quickly. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. It's a good thing, he says, to work. That word is worship. I'm just telling you in my heart of hearts, as a child of God, I don't care who you watch or what you do, even if you're watching me tonight or this morning. There's no place like being in the house of God. There's no place like being in God's house, worshiping with God's people, getting somebody to come up and speak to you, getting somebody to give you a hug around the neck. 
where God is here with you and He's saying, and we're saying, it's a good thing to give thanks today, He says. Well, does anybody in here today have a reason to give thanks? Hey, all of us. He said it's a good thing to take time to give thanks. I think, and I, and I, I pretty much may speak for myself some in this. It's easy sometimes when you pray, just say, God, I need for you to help me with this. Or, Lord, I need for you to help me. With I got this situation, and nothing wrong with that. God wants you to do that. But sometimes I just think you need to say, Lord, I want to take a, sometime during your day, Lord, I just want to take a minute to thank you for everything you've done for me. God, I just want to say thank you, God, for all the blessings that for however many years you've lived that, that God has blessed you with. And, and just kind of say, Lord, I'm not asking you for anything today. I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you. And I'll tell you, when you come to church and you worship him, you're not only saying that you thank him, but you're showing him that you thank him. When you come into the place of worship. Because what most people really never understand, our missionaries and our, our, and our folks that do our, uh, lead in our mission work understand this. That when you have to, that when you can come to church, that we forget sometimes, because it's so easy in America, that coming to church is a privilege. We never think of coming to church as a privilege. But I can tell you that in many countries and many places in the world, they cannot come to church today. They cannot listen. You take China and Russia. They've cut all TV broadcasts that has to do anything with Christian, their Facebook stuff. There cannot be any Christian influence in those countries. And there are millions upon millions of people there that will never know Jesus because you have to hide or be killed and you cannot open the churches and you cannot go. I think one of the greatest privileges Americans we have so far, I don't know how much longer it's going to stay like this, but we can come to church. Sunday mornings by church folks is still considered a day of worship, that, but yet most of the world doesn't see that. So let's go on. To every fourth, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. God said, to me, he says, Lord, I come because I'm thankful for your loving kindness. Lord, I'm thankful for all you've done for me. God, I thank you that when I called on you, came, he says, in the morning and every night, thanking you, faithful, upon the instrument, ten springs, upon the psaltery, upon the sharp, a harp with a solemn sound. See, there's two things he involves with this worship here. One of them is the praying. Another is the music. Now, one thing about it, I struggle with a little bit of folks, and I, I, I have to be careful, I, I'd be happy, that do not think and do not have music in their church. And there are folks that do not do that. I'm going to tell you that right now. What are they going to do when they get to heaven? <laughs> they... They singing and playing the harp and these other things there. And they miss out on so much. He said, I thank you, Lord, for your blessings. I come to praise you with my singing here, with what you've done, and to give you praise for that. Then he gets real serious here. He says, for thou, Lord, has made me glad through thy work, and I will triumph in the works of thy hands. So what's he, there's two front time frames that he talks about in there. He says, Lord, thou hast made me happy. What's he looking at there? All the times that God's blessed him. All the things that God has done for him. When he looks at the children of Israel, his people, how God had had lifted them, had made them, had brought them uh, across the Red Sea and how he got them out. He said, Lord, I want to thank you for what you've done. 
But as a child of God, it ain't never over being done. I'm thankful for what God's done, but I'm also like this guy that wrote this psalm here. When he said, I will, that's the future there. He said, I thank you for what you've done in my past. But I'll tell you, God, what I'm looking for when we triumph in the future. And God will triumph in the future. Satan in a world that we live in today is winning this war. I'm not going to deny that. He's winning this battle, brother. It's an evil world. But he says, I look forward to the day, Lord, where we will do what? Triumph. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. That's his, one of his names. He has much influence on the world that you and I live in today. But I thank God, as this guy writes, there's a day coming where Satan will not even exist anymore. When there will not be any temptation, there will not be anything to make you unhappy. All your life will be victory in Jesus. That's what he says. So I will triumph because of what you've delivered me from. Because of God, where I believe you're taking uh, me to, he says in that scripture. Oh Lord. How great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Lord, I can never, your thought, now the Bible says one thing about you and I and God. We'll never understand everything God does. So, I mean, not you know me. I have people for all my years that have come to me and said, why this, why that, the other. My answer is, I don't know the answer to that. Only God knows that. This writer, when he says that, he says, Lord, your, your works are great, but your thoughts are very deep. And what he's saying is, Lord, and the Bible tells us this, God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. He's way above us. He recognizes this. He also recognizes the fact that he has trusted God and that he wants to praise him because of what he has done, even though he does not understand everything. I'd love to tell you and have a chart up here somewhere where we could say, this is heaven here. And I'd have them listed up there. Everything you could expect, your address, what your house is going to look like, or your mansion, whatever you call it. And, 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 and give you a vivid picture. The Bible doesn't give us that, though. In my father's house are many mansions. That's all he says. I don't know what God considers a mansion. People say, well, how big is it? I don't know. I don't know how big a mansion is. I ain't never had one. I ain't never been in one. I see them. And many of these TV stars act like they got more money than God because they build mansions that they don't even know how much they cost. But he said, Lord, I thank you that I don't know. And I'll tell you what, you better be grateful you don't know everything. And if you ever think you know as much as God, you're in trouble. He said, Lord, I do not understand it. But then he, he kind of takes a turn here in verse 6. He says, a brutish man knoweth not, and neither does a fool understand this. What is this he's talking about? What God has done and what God's about to do. He said, a foolish man will never understand all the things that's happened in this world, and they'll never care about what's coming. That is what he says in this scripture here. They, this is... Um, I look this up when he says in that scripture, a brutish man. You know what that literally means? I'm going to read it to you. Being dull or stupid. That's what it means. A man that does not understand God, does not understand what... The writer of this song said he's dull and he's stupid. Because listen, we may not know everything about God, like to know things we know, but I can tell you one thing. We can know enough to keep us on the right road. 
We can know enough to believe there was an old rugged cross up there where, <coughs> where our Savior died. We don't, I don't know all the ins and outs of the Bible and everything, but I do know this like our little children. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. I ain't got to be 97 years old know that. I've lived with the blessings. And he says in that scripture, a brutish man doesn't know all this. A fool doesn't understand this. When I grew up, Times are very different now. But one thing that I would always get in trouble about, and at that time, my parents were what I'd call religious people. But there were certain things you didn't do. You didn't call people stupid. And one thing, if I wanted to really get in trouble, call somebody a fool. My daddy didn't play that now, folks. That would get you a whipping right quick. He says that that's what people that don't know the Lord, don't know what he's doing, nor know what he's going to do. He calls them that because they do not understand. And then he says this. When the wicked spring as the grass where they're everywhere, and when the workers, all the workers of iniquity are sin are flourishing, that's that's the world today. He says, wicked are as thick as grass. It's a sinful, evil world, right? He says, when they do that, and when the workers of iniquity, those that flaunt the sins, begin to flourish. That's the world I live in today. Where sin is flourishing. Where sin is become a political issue where sin that the Bible condemns the politician says are okay sin is not a political issue sin is a Bible issue sin will be taken care of we may not do it here and it may not be done but I want to tell you one day everybody stands before the judge and there ain't going to be no get out of jail cards there they ain't go get no go and pay in your bail, get in, pay your bail, and get released. Eh, them days over with. Because he says in that scripture, the wicked spring is grass, the workers of iniquity flourish, they shall be destroyed forever. Who? Those that throw their sins in God's face? Those that try to say that we don't love God if we can't love their sin, I want you to know I love all them folks, but I can't stand the sin they do. And I'm not going to back up on that. God loves them. God will save them. But it, what he's saying here is if you continue on in that, what does he say? You shall be destroyed. Wow. So the reasons we praise God, he's, what he's saying about these folks is what? They can't praise God. For lo, thy enemies, O Lord, or thy enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. Now what he says in that is this. These folks can't praise you like I do. Because they don't know you like I know you. Lord, they don't like you. Lord, they criticize you. And so as long as they have this state of mind and this spirit in their life, Lord, they'll never be able to worship. They'll never be able to sing the praises to God. It just is never going to happen to there. Why? Go back to where we started. They do not understand you. They do not understand you. Going on through. But, now remember what I always tell you when you run into Scripture in the Bible and you run into that little old word, but. Now, help the last six, seven verses. He's condemned evil. He's condemned wickedness. He's condemned people that are against God. He has put them in condemnation. But, when he comes to this Scripture here, what does it say? But my horn, 
Who's he talking about here? The dude that's writing this psalm here. He said, Lord, I have seen you work in other people's lives. I have seen destruction because they ignored you. He said, but me, my horn, thou shalt exalt like the horn of a unicorn, and I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Anointed with fresh oil. What he's saying in that scripture is this. When the Bible is mentioned and you see that word horn used, it means strength. The horn of a unicorn means strength. So he is saying to this, he said, Lord, my horn is strong. My faith is good. What he's saying is this, and this is where we stand and this is what applies to us. In the midst of opposition, what's he saying? God, I'm going to go bow down. In the midst of opposition, I'm going to stand on what you said. Whether I make enemies or make friends, I'm going to stand on what the Word of God says, and I'm depending on your strength to go with me and help me through these times. He says, but my horn shall like the horn of a unicorn, and I shall be anointed. Fresh oil. That anointing means fresh blessings. Bible says this, that God's blessings are new every day. That is what he's saying. Lord, I'm going to get fresh Oh, I have been blessed and I've been blessed and you've been blessed, but he says, I know this, Lord. The greatest blessings are still yet to come, folks. You ain't never been as blessed as you're going to be blessed one day. He says, Lord, I'm looking forward to the blessings. I'm looking forward to to what you're going to do and, and, and come in my life and all of this. My eyes, in verse 11, shall see my desire and my enemies, my ears, shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. What he's saying is this. Lord, this is what I know. And this is what I know. It hadn't got as hard as it's going to get yet. Uh -uh. Not for the Christian, not for the church. If what Jesus says that I preach on on Sunday night is right, it hadn't got nearly as hard as as we progress toward the end of time. And we are, very rapidly especially leading up to the seven years of tribulation when the Antichrist comes and rules the world. He will destroy the church. He will burn and cut off the heads of Christian people. He will try to kill every Christian that he can. That's what he's going to do. The wrath of God will fall on him. He says says in that verse, Lord, my eyes shall see my desire of my enemy, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that will rise up against me. And I think that I've pastored enough, and you've heard enough preachers over the years that you understand that the closer this, and this is supposed to happen like this. And when I look at the last years that the world stands, these are things I look at. He says this, The wicked will rise up against me. Will rise up against me. I know that, God. But he says this, But the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. You know what a cedar in Lebanon means? A cedar tree in Lebanon was considered the biggest strongest tree that stood in the ground. When you were compared to a cedar tree or cedar in Babylon, you need to understand something. It was a tree, I read this, says it was the largest tree probably that existed at that time. And not only that, it it was so spread out, it was majestic. 
He says it's going to grow. Now I could, I could take you back to verse 7 where I left you from. Where he said, what the evil are no going to do? They're going to grow like grass, right? And they're going to wither. But God's people are going to be like the cedars of Lebanon. We're going to grow and grow and grow and strong. God is going to bless them. He says that the others are going to be destroyed, but he will bless those like that, the palm tree, and he shall grow like a cedar tree or in Lebanon. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Shall flourish in the courts. Let me just say this to you. I'm about through. I am through. Kind of sort of. Worshiping. All this is about worshiping. And why we should worship. Why the people that do not know God know anything about worship. He says in this, don't worry about tomorrow. He says you'll be planted in the house of the Lord and flourish in the courts of God. One of these days, we're going to see blessings we can't even imagine, we can't even envision. You're going to understand all the preachers you've heard and all the things you've heard. And when you get to heaven and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you see what he says, he sees ahead there. It's like that song says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene. That's him. That's us. There's old, I've I, I mentioned this a few times. That old song quartet she used to sing. They used to have a preacher, and, and of course, years ago, I used to sing with him, we sang one. And he was the tenor voice. And there was a song called Looking for a City. And in, in that song, that tenor would just come up and say, Looking for a city. He could do it. I can't do it. I ain't no tenor. I ain't no nothing. But I'm going to tell you what. When he sang that, it was almost like heaven came down. When he talked, it became so real at that time. Let me take the last two verses and I'll quit. I'm glad God put this verse in here. <laughs> I'm glad that he thought about us old folks too at the end of time. That we, that you know, Sometimes, it's kind of like preachers or old folks anywhere. Sometimes uh, you reach a certain age and people don't think you can do nothing no more. And they want to do what? Put you out of the pasture, don't they? You know what I say? Thank God for the old folks. Now, I agree. There's some of them need to be put out of the pasture. I ain't going to tell you where they live at and reside, but y'all probably know. But God says about his church now. This is what he says about his church. And I love it. He says, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. In other words, they'll still be able to bring forth fruit. When I read that scripture... I had never even thought about me in that. You know what I thought about? Jimmy Russell. Jimmy Russell, who died, whose funeral's tomorrow. And I don't want to say too much, because I'll probably say something like this in the funeral tomorrow. After Jimmy Russell got saved, there was not a day that he did not want to serve God in this church or wherever he was. So two years before he died, his life was going. He was working. He was working here. He was working in Bible school. And I never seen a too much like a 90-year-old man love little children like he did. The last really great, of course, I've visited him for many times in the last few months. But the thing that stands out above him for me 
was vacation Bible school this year. The week before vacation Bible school, he in Maryland came to my office. Now, I'll, I'll tell this story to you, Marco. This, this is me relating to him. And he came in there and he said, this is like, what, four months ago or something like that, five months ago, three months, I don't know. Preacher, I want to get my ice machine out there and make snow cones for the little boys. He, you got to understand something, folks. This dude can't hardly walk. He's got oxygen on there. He, his wife, he's in cancer and his lung, he's just in bad shape. He said, I want to do that. Marilyn's back there behind going, no, 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 tell him no, tell him no, tell him no. I said, Mr. Jimmy, I don't know if you need to do that. I want to do that. I want to get my popcorn machine down there. So you know what two days of Bible school he did? He got his popcorn he got his ice machine, got somebody to bring him, and he sat back there at that table and made popcorn and snowballs for the little kids. How old was he? Ninety years old. He says, and when, like I said, when I read this, this is what came to my mind. They shall bring forth fruit in old age, and they shall be fat and flourishing. I don't know about the fat part. <laughs> but I do know that that's probably true because many of the folks I know that are old like I am are fat. And I mean, not all of them. Some of you are slim and trim, but I'm just saying. I went to the doctor yesterday. I had to get on scale. I gained four pounds since the last time I went. Fat. Huh? Fluffy. fluffy. There you go. That's better, Mike. I was fluffy. I might have to write that in my Bible. They shall be fat and flush and fluffy. <laughs> and flourishing. You know all that all jokes aside. Let me just tell you what that means. You don't ever get too old to do what Jesus wants you to do. If he wants you to do it. He gives you the capability to do it, no matter what your age is. What your age is. I had Mr. Lynn Gardner would know him. There was a preacher up in Lancaster, South Carolina. I believe his name was it Billy Deaton. Was that his name? Billy Deaton was blind. And I went up there one night. They had a revival in the church. That was when I was up at a Kershaw preaching. I went there to see him. He was old, his wife, and somebody had to help him get on the stage. His wife got up there and read the scripture for him. And he stood there and preached a great message. A great message. Could not see could not hardly walk by himself. But he still wanted to preach. And they let him. That he was flourishing even in his old age. Last verse. All these things we've talked about is to show that the Lord is upright. What does that mean? That whatever God tells you, you can believe it. Whatever promise God makes you, write it down. Whatever God says is going to happen, it's going to happen. Nothing can change that. Then the, the writer of the psalmist says what? For he is my rock. A rock is somebody you lean on. I've had friends that I could say, he was my rock, or he is my rock. Jesus, is that, I'll refer back to the hymnals again. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide. My soul in thee. He said, Lord, you've been my rock. You've helped me through all this, Lord, however far I am. The only reason I got here is where I am today is, God, you, you carried me, you toted me, you helped me, I leaned on you, you gave me strength when I were weak, and that's why I'm here. 
Last few words. And there is no unrighteousness in him. There is no unrighteousness in him. A rock represents something that is perfectly stable. That a man, sometimes, many in the world are so big, a man can't move them. That's what he talks here about representing God. He's that immovable rock. Well, Brother Ray back there, he sings a song every once in a while. It says, my anchor holds. No matter how bad the storm gets, I'm hooked into that rock. That ain't going to let me drown, ain't going to let me die, but I'm hooked to a rock that's going to see me through this. So he is worshiping God. He is praising God. He is thanking God on the Lord's day for all the blessings there's several reasons, many reasons that you can come to church. I'm not going to deny that. But some of them, and not, I'm not saying there's bad reasons unless you come because you want to get the glory. But if you come because you want God to get glory and you want Him to be honored and you want to take an hour or two out of your week just come in and say, thank you, God. It's been a tough week. See, I can say that today. It's been a tough week. But here I am. God helped me get through. God made it possible. Something me and my wife prayed every day of our life. Lord, help me feel better. Help me. And God's done that. And your prayers too. Don't get me wrong on that. I know you have. So we need definitely to find time to pray to God, to praise God, and to worship God. I don't think that you can ever get satisfaction in your relationship with Him until those three things happen. You got to pray, you got to praise Him, and you got to worship Him. That's what the Bible requires that you do. And you may have a good relationship. But you'll never have a great relationship until those three things are done. So as we have our hymn of invitation today, as Mimi uh, comes to lead us in it. If you're here today and, you know, God's been so good to you, we'll take just a moment to say, Lord, I don't want anything. I just want to thank you for your blessings today. Do that. If you're here today and you're going through the burdens of life, it's not as good as it once was, then you pray to Him and ask Him to help it be better. Because you see, there's nothing going on in your life that He don't know about. He knows your happiness, your sadness, everything. And I always refer almost every service to this one comes to the end of time or night, we take the last minutes and pray that God says in his word that you have not because you ask not. That's something to think about, isn't it? If I'd ask God for it, now God ain't going to give you everything you ask for. I'm going to tell you that now. Because we really don't know how to ask for everything we need. Sometimes we just ask for what we want. God didn't say he'd give you what you want. He said, but I'll give you what you need. And for me, I can tell you, he's done that. And people my age are thereabouts. They know, they've seen the blessings of God be poured out on them. That, fr that song said, fresh oil. Folks, I know what it feels like. Have fresh oil <laughs> poured on you. I do. So if you're here today and we have our hymn of invitation, I'll I just put it pretty simple. This was a guy that knew the Lord here. That's why he could make those statements that he made in there. The most important thing is not just praying or coming to church or 
any of that stuff I preached about this morning. The most important thing is being sure that you're a child of the king today. Now, Satan doesn't want that for you. He wants you to stay wandering. Because if you do that, you're going to spend the same misery he is. God is a God of grace and a God of mercy. And I thank God for that. That he saved a sinner like me. That song we sing, I'm tell you, I can tell everybody's life story in here that is a Christian today. I can tell your life story. You know what that is? You're just a sinner saved by grace. That's what all of us are. That's what Paul was, Peter, James, John. You go on through the whole list. They were just like you and I, sinners saved by grace. By grace. So if you don't know them, you just don't have peace that, that the Bible says you have this hope that if something happens to you if I were doing your funeral tomorrow that you pretty you know that you ain't going to be here that you could be up in heaven with the Lord you know that I be, I'm firm believe you know if you got it if you ain't got it you're just not sure when it's so easy and also in closing if uh, you know Anything you need to talk with the Lord about? Is there anything in life you need God to do? How many times do I, most time I talk with him it's about something he needs to do? That's it. But he does it. Okay, let's stand please as Mimi comes. Hymn number 307. Lord, I love you. Lord, I want you to touch my life. Help me as I go ahead on in this Lord. Let me serve sure about where I'm going. But Lord, give me a peace about it. Give me peace about it. I don't want to say, but I know where you go. Appreciate it. Come back tonight. If you hadn't been able to attend the Sunday night service, services, let me encourage you. We're talking on living in the end times. As we look at the world around us, look at what the Bible says. Do we think we're there according to that? And that's one of the things we'll be talking about tonight. So come back and be with us. We won't keep you long. I promise you'll be out of here by 9 o'clock. Um, Clayton, dismiss us with prayer.